welcome to my mommy's podcast. This episode is powered by Ritual. They make vitamins specifically designed just for women. Ritual vitamins contain nine essential nutrients that most women just don't get enough of, including vitamin B12 as methylcobalamin form, folate and not the synthetic folic acid, D3, K2, vitamin E, omega-3 fatty acids, boron, chelated iron, and a proprietary form of magnesium. Ritual supplies all of these in forms that are easily absorbed and utilized, and their capsules are vegan, gluten-free, allergen-free, and non-GMO. They have both a prenatal and a regular women's multivitamin, both designed specifically for women and synergistic for women's hormones. Did you know, for instance, that 40% of women cannot properly use folic acid due to an MTHFR gene variation? Ritual contains a natural form of folate and synergistic nutrients, so the entire multi is more effective. This is especially important pre-pregnancy or during pregnancy, because during pregnancy especially, folate is vital. According to OBGYN Jason Rothbart, most women don't find out they're pregnant until about four to seven weeks pregnant, which is past the first 28 days. In the first 28 days, the baby's organs are rapidly forming and the neural tube, which becomes the central nervous system and the vertebral column, is almost completely formed and closed by the end of 28 days. In other words, you need those nutrients in your body before you get pregnant. The essential nutrient folate helps promote healthy development of the neural tube, and this is why many doctors recommend taking a quality prenatal for several months before trying to get pregnant. Ritual makes this easy with both a prenatal and a regular women's multivitamin, and you can learn more about both by going to wellnessmama.com forward slash go forward slash ritual. So again, wellnessmama.com forward slash go forward slash R-I-T. UAL. This podcast is sponsored by Thrive Market, a company that I have known and loved since its very beginning. The goal of Thrive Market is to make real food affordable for everyone, and now they help their half a million members, including me, get organic foods that we love delivered to our door for less. Think of it as an online combination of Costco and Whole Foods with tons of organic, allergy friendly, paleo, vegan, keto, and other options. Their annual membership earns you free gifts and guaranteed savings. And this is one of my favorite parts. An annual membership that you pay for also sponsors a free membership for a family in need. So you'll get 25 to 50% off top brands. And as a tip, I always look at the new Thrive Market brand products that provide an even bigger discount on their 500 plus high quality products. You can check out all of their products and save an additional 25% on your first order by going to thrivemarket.com forward slash WM. So that's thrivemarket.com forward slash WM for Wellness Mama. And if you're already a member, still go to thrivemarket.com forward slash WM and check out because Thrive often runs deals of the day and gifts with purchase. So even if you're already a member, you can often get free products when you shop on certain days. So always keep an eye out for those and always check out the new deals at thrivemarket.com forward slash WM. Hello and welcome to the Wellness Mama podcast. I'm Katie from wellnessmama.com and I'm here today with a friend I met recently and I cannot wait to jump into this conversation. I'm here with Dr. Ty Carzoli who has conducted research at Florida State in cardiovascular and muscle physiology. He has a master's in sports and health science and a doctor of chiropractic degree. He specializes in a really cool form of upper cervical work that I'm probably going to butcher the name, but I think it's called orthospinology, which we will talk about today. And we're also going to delve into some of his other areas of specialty, a lot of which will really apply to a lot of you listening. So Ty, welcome and thanks for being here. Katie, thanks so much for having me on. Uh, You nailed the name, by the way, orthospinology, and um, I'm honored to share the mic with you, and I absolutely love the mission you're on to help empower people to take control of their health through education and understanding. Uh, My sister is a mother of four. She absolutely loves you and your work, and she lost it when I told her I was coming on your podcast. So thanks for having me. Oh my gosh, of course. I knew when we met at an event that I had to have you on because we geeked out on all kinds of alternative health and spine science for hours. And it was amazing. And I can't wait to share you with the audience. So to start for a little bit of background, can you explain how you got into this field in the first place? 
Yeah, absolutely. So I, uh, I come from a large medical family. Um, my father is a neonatologist, so he specializes in uh, helping with babies that have any birth complications, premature babies, anything that could kind of make them a high risk pregnancy. And uh, he started this practice when I was really young. And so some of my earliest memories are actually spending the night at the hospital with him, uh, getting to hang out in the nursery, stay in the on-call room, and be around and exposed to that environment. And it was really awesome to see him help people in these extreme type, times of crisis. You know, there's probably few things scarier than something going wrong with a newborn infant. So I think that really inspired me to go into healthcare um, and, and, and help people through the medium of health. You know, the more you learn about health versus disease, you kind of realize that in our healthcare system, I think we have uh, the best emergency medicine in the world, really bar none. But I think one of the issues is that we've gotten so good at treating emergencies that we we tend to treat everything like an emergency. And I think eight or nine of the top 10 killers are uh, considered chronic disease, which is somewhat synonymous with lifestyle disease. And that's really synonymous with preventable disease. Um, at least modifiable in many cases. And so, you know, it, it's interesting to think that a lot of these things that are killing people in our country are in some way preventable through lifestyle changes. And sometimes there's limitations. They might not have access to certain things or might not have the knowledge of certain things. Um, but that's why I think patient education and equipping people with the tools to, to navigate their health on their own um, can really, really open up the door to kind of a health renaissance, really. Yeah, I love that. I think that's such an important point. And you're so right. You're not going to be able to go into an ER and get help for a chronic disease. And I think there was an article that came out this week even that said that the estimate was, I think, 11 million people died in 2017 based on food and lifestyle-based diseases and factors. And so I think you're right. This is a growing problem. Um, and I loved your approach when we spoke before because you're so much about getting the control back in the patient's hand and being their advocate and their partner, but not taking over their care, giving them the power back, which I think is such an important mindset shift. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's crucial. And it, it's um, it's really remarkable to see how people perseverate and kind of can catastrophize when they're, you know, titled with these diagnoses that they don't always understand very well and they don't understand what that means or or what the prognosis should be. Um, and, and it's a shame because I think if people had a little bit more understanding of their health and, and some of these associated conditions that can go wrong, I think they'd feel a lot more empowered uh, to get back to their, their old life. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a great springboard. So let's start there because I feel like when we spoke before, you have really good perspective on a whole lot of different um, just different alternative therapies and problems that people are coming into you with. So can you walk us through some of these things that people may not necessarily understand about your area of expertise specifically? Yeah, certainly. So like you said, I'm an upper cervical specialist chiropractor. So I, I still analyze and treat the entire spine, but I spend most of my time and attention up at the very top of the neck. So the occiput, atlas, and C2 or axis. So Atlas Axis, that's C1 and C2. They've got a couple different names. I'll try to keep the name, uh, keep using the name Atlas throughout this. But that area is really, really uh, vitally important and complex. And I think it deserves a specific and specialized practitioner because of that. The Atlas bone has uh, no disc above or below it. And the disc really, among other things, it functions to kind of absorb and cushion and dissipate shock. Uh, this is also the most mobile uh, joint in the entire spine. So between it being a poor shock absorber and hypermobile, that's really the recipe for susceptibility to injury by displacement. And that can be a big problem because when that misaligns, there's sort of a handful of things that can go wrong. And I like to classify them as sort of hardware problems and software problems. And what I mean by that are those orthopedic issues, those musculoskeletal issues, and those neurological issues. And before we go any further, because I usually have a, a model that I can I can show patients while I explain this, but I'll do my best to sort of describe to you what that might look like. So just imagine if the head were a basketball and place like a, a ring-shaped kind of disc under it. Now, it's a little differently shaped than that, but that'll work for this analogy. And then put a smaller ball under that, and that would be your C2. Uh, so if you can kind of imagine that that atlas, that middle ring-shaped structure, um, that can move in a series of different ways. And those balls could kind of move on each other's surface in a way that can interfere with both the mechanical function of that area and the neurological function. 
Uh, you can imagine if that bone slides out of place, it's not going to do so like a little Jenga block. It's going to bring everything south of that along for the ride. So I kind of say, you know, if you have an atlas misalignment, there's a chance you have a full spine misalignment. And I think my favorite patient case to illustrate that point, we have a um, patient that survived a plane crash 20 years ago and came in here for right-sided knee pain, totally unaware that she had a cartoonishly misaligned cervical spine. And uh, naturally, as we're working on her neck, she's wondering, you know, what the heck are you doing, man? My knee hurts. Like, can't you work on my knee? And sure enough, after a couple corrections on her neck, we got about 65% structural resolution there, meaning she was about 65% closer to straight up and down. And that made the stress on her knee a lot more normal um, than that very asymmetrical strain she'd be, been enduring for many years. So that's a cool one because now she's since hiked to Mount Everest Base Camp. Uh, I think she did a month in the Grand Canyon. Um, she's done the CrossFit game. She's just, you know, at her most active lifestyle yet. And what brought her in here was knee pain that she thought she had a knee problem. Wow. And I bet so many people end up with a diagnosis related to their knee or even like surgery probably at times, right? That go back to spine or some other part of the body. All the time, you know, and it's, it's, um, it's tough because again, when with emergency medicine, if you, you know, if somebody has a wound to their leg, it's probably going to hurt right there where that wound is. But with these more chronic things, there's often a disconnect. You know, I like to tell patients, if you step on a dog's tail, it barks out of its mouth, right? So we have to realize that the body is obviously very intimately connected and that these uh, kind of upstream problems can cause downstream consequences. So now alongside those uh, structural issues, it's important to know or familiarize yourself with something called Wolf's Law. So Dr. Wolf was a scientist that found that your bone adapts in accordance with the stresses placed on it. So this is why astronauts coming back from space have very um, brittle bones. Their bone mineral density has decreased and their muscle mass is wasted. This is also why as we become inactive as we age and our muscles waste as we age, we often see uh, bone mineral density decrease. So uh, similarly, this is why athletes have very dense bones, right? They're either lifting weights or grappling with other athletes, but they're doing these things that stimulate their body to uh, create denser bones and stronger bones. But not only will the bone quality change in that way, the bone shape itself will change. So what can happen is if anything uh, moves your body off of its normal axis of pressure. So imagine if you have a misalignment and it's probably easiest to think of this forward head posture right and you can probably picture uh, maybe an elderly person with their head kind of pushed forward and their butt sort of tucked under them and that's exactly what that tends to look like and so what's happened there is that the axis of pressure of their body mass has moved off of its normal place right so in this case it's typically moved forward and as the head comes forward well the butt's going to have to kind of tuck under to bring that center of mass back. But what's happening is all that tissue that's picking up the strain uh, is now being stressed in a very atypical way. And so what will happen is in, in the case of forward head postures, especially the front of the discs will take on an abnormal amount of load. The structures on the back of the spine and, and neck will be strained in a very unhealthy way. There can be soft tissue changes. The soft tissue corollary to Wolf's Law is something called Davis's Law. And so we know when soft tissue is strained for long enough, it also starts to make uh, changes to itself to adapt to those stresses. So those are the types of things we want to prevent because on a longer timeline, that leads to degeneration and the associated consequences of that, which interfere heavily with nervous system function and mobility. And I would argue that the mobility of your spine is one of the most important things for driving a healthy brain. Um, the stimulation that we get through movement for our brain is crucially important to keep our brain plastic, adaptive, kind of malleable and responsive. And, you know, we sort of mistakenly say or think that we become inactive as we age. And I would maybe argue that it's probably more evidence that as we become inactive, we really accelerate aging. Um, and that activity and that physical movement really keeps us healthy. That makes sense. So in your opinion, what are like some of those ideal forms of movement and amount of movement? Because I feel like in any area of health, but especially like diet and exercise, people have so much confusion because there's so many differing opinions. So what's your take on the best ways for people to move? That's a fantastic question. Um, well, I'll tell you what I tell all of my patients is that I think yoga is the second best thing you can do for your spine. Uh, chiropractic obviously being 
the first in my opinion. But I think really what people should consider when they approach their training and exercise is just remember that your goal is to kind of stress your body with a spectrum of different physical stressors. You want to be adaptive to all sorts of things. Now, if you're a competitive athlete, you need to be very specific in your training. But if your goal is just health and wellness and, and to keep your brain and body as healthy as you can for as long as you can, I think you should, you should focus on a spectrum of different physical stresses Yoga being a fantastic one, I am a big advocate of resistance training or lifting weights. I think that uh, muscle mass is one of the most protective things someone can have as they age. So I really encourage people to do that. I am not such a big advocate of some of the traditional um, aerobic endurance type stuff. Uh, you know, it's again, if you're competing, then go for it. But if you're doing it just to be healthy, I think that you can get a lot of similar adaptations through means that are lower impact or in many cases, keep your spine in a healthier position uh, during the exercise. I'm kind of thinking about road bikes right now that unfortunately to generate a lot of power, you sort of have to put your spine in a slightly compromised position. So I tend to steer people away from the really high mileage things, unless that's something they're really passionate about um, and point them towards lifting weights and, and yoga. Um, I think those are some of the most important things from a physical standpoint that we can do for our health. Yeah, that makes sense. And I've read a lot about that as well, as far as, I mean, cardio has benefits for the heart and you want to like make sure you're moving, but as far as for the bones and alignment and stuff, it makes complete sense that things like yoga and weightlifting would be the way to go. And another thing, speaking of the structure in the spine that we talked about in person, and I'd love for you to go deep on is you mentioned you have this like very mobile, but also kind of, you got to be careful with the neck and the upper cervical. And I mentioned that I hate when they like crack my neck, the chiropractors have it. Like, I kind of avoid it because I kind of hate that. Um, and you had a great point on this. So can you talk us through your thoughts on that? Yeah. And before I do, I actually just wanted to respond and say, you know, I, I did not mean to omit any sort of aerobic training, but I think that you can get a lot of similar adaptations from sprint training or interval training that you can get from some of those aerobic style training. So I would maybe steer people toward those types of things if they still wanted to get their heart rate up um, and make those cardiovascular adaptations. But to answer your other question, yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up. I, I, I think this is the, the probably the least exciting point, but uh, a lot of people don't realize that there's tons of chiropractors that are not doing any twisting and cracking style adjusting. You know, we don't do any of that here. Um, and we're not alone in that. There are tons of people moving away from it. And you know, it, it's, it is even that style of adjusting is fairly safe. Um, but I would make a case that if someone is adjusting uh, and they don't have objective evidence for the state or position of the spine, well, the existing scientific literature seems to point toward what's called motion and static palpation or using your hands to assess spinal position, the existing literature doesn't shine a very favorable light on the efficacy of that. So, you know, those, the people that do that aren't here to defend themselves. So I don't want to spend too much time harping on that, but we'll suffice it to say, go explore the li literature yourself if you're curious about that and, and kind of know that, that this is what I would recommend for certainly myself or my loved ones is that they, they need some objective criteria to guide what treatments the spine will receive. And in the case of what we do here, and most upper cervical doctors will do a digital x-ray to, to render kind of specialty images that show exactly how this upper cervical region is misaligned and how that can affect the brainstem. So how do we adjust, you might be wondering. So there's a series of different things you can do. We use a, a large table-mounted instrument Unfortunately, it sounds very esoteric to describe. It's, it's something that tends to make a lot more sense when you see it. But we can orient this thing to get pretty much any vector of force in a sort of dome over the patient's head as they lay on their side. So we would take these digital x-rays, figure out exactly how they've misaligned three-dimensionally, and then we would plug that into this machine, which would then line up a very, very specific corrective vector of force, and then apply a really gentle impulse that's usually between an eighth of an inch and a quarter of an inch right over what's called the transverse process of the atlas. So if you kind of gently put your finger right behind your jaw, um, you might feel a bone kind of behind your ear. It's sort of right in that window that we have to get to do this adjustment. So it's, it's very, very precise. It's very calculated and it's very, very 
gentle. So it's a far cry from what people are used to or expecting when they think of chiropractic. And usually patients sit up off the table after they do it. And the first thing they say is, was that it? Because it is very gentle. And, and um, you're not alone in, in having some concerns about that other style of adjusting. I know it can be sort of unsettling and off-putting for people. So I, it's important people know they do have lots of other options. Good to know. And what are most people coming into you for? Or do you just see like a huge range of patients? Oh, I'm glad you asked that. No, you know, we see, um, and it's kind of a shame that the example I gave earlier was a more mechanical pain-based one because that's probably only 20% of our patients that have neck pain, back pain, knee pain type stuff. Uh, the vast majority of people coming in to see us are coming to get help with things like post-concussion syndrome, migraines and headaches, vertigo, dizziness, disequilibrium, including Meniere's, brain fog, trigeminal neuralgia, occipital neuralgia. We get some seizures patients, some tremors patients, occasionally patients with tics, torticollis, infrequently, but sometimes some GI stuff. That's not stuff I, I am a specialist in. So that's, that's more like if they've been everywhere else and then they come in here, sometimes they get some results there. Uh, we see a lot of patients with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is a uh, rare and, and not well understood connective tissue disorder that affects the collagen protein folding. Uh, we see people with TMJ, eustachian tube issues, and then, like we said, of course, the neck pain, back pain, some of those more orthopedic issues. So you just said several buzzwords that I hear from a lot of readers about, and I'm obviously not a doctor or a chiropractor, not qualified to, to do any of this, but I would love to, if you don't mind, go a little deeper on a couple specific issues. Um, specifically, recently, I've heard from a lot of people struggling with migraines that are resistant to a lot of stuff they try, um, and also people with post-concussive syndrome, including a friend of mine. So I'd love if you could kind of walk us through your approach to those. Yeah. So... I, you know what? I will. And before we get too deep in the physiology, if I can, I'm going to hop up on a soapbox really quick. Uh, and I want to say a couple things just sort of to help people understand healthcare and especially the alternative healthcare uh, professions. And I'm doing air quotes when I say that. So we have to remember science is an approach to problem solving and its goal is to discern, to discern fact from fallacy. So good science and a command of it should be pretty emotionally neutral. Um, it's perfectly okay and normal for scientists to disagree, and it's common for there to be some gaps in between clinical practice and scientific exploration. This is sort of an unfortunate but seemingly unavoidable truth. Uh, so we have to do our best to navigate those gaps thoughtfully as best uh, and always best serve the patient. You know, and, and those types of uh, missteps are, are not something um, I'm immune to. So I'll do my best to keep things um, accurate and uh, digestible for everyone. But uh, there's also some, some things people should understand is that, you know, we should approach si science, its findings, and our understanding of them with humility and a healthy skepticism. It's good to challenge these theories uh, and try to neither be too dogmatic nor defensive. I'll do my best to not put my foot in my mouth on that. And uh, I certainly have my own biases and I'll try to expose them as we go. So any explanation I give here is one that hopefully a year from now, I'll be able to give you a better, more well-rounded, more updated explanation. And maybe I'll even say, you know what, I disagree with something I, I thought was true then. So with that all in mind, uh, hopefully kind of painting a picture for you a little bit better. And, and what I'm getting at with that is that some of these things are not perfectly well understood. Uh, some of them we have really, really sound hypotheses for what happened or what is going on, but uh, not everything has been as scientifically validated or vetted as we would have liked. And that's probably true of everyone in these alternative healthcare professions is that we'd all desperately love more research, uh, more scientific inquiry and investigation into what we're doing. But the reality is science has to be funded by someone. And if there's not a clear financial incentive to dump what can be hundreds of thousands of dollars into research, then some of those things won't get funded. So there are some issues where these things have been tested and true and routinely proven uh, effective in clinical practice, but we don't have the randomized controlled trials that everyone would love to back them up. So uh, hopefully, hopefully that kind of paints a picture and, and um, I'll get off my soapbox on that. But the kind of working model right now, there's a few different things that, that are important to understand. So your spinal cord functions essentially as the information highway of your body. Most signals, there's of course the cranial nerves, but a lot of the, the signaling from the, to and from the brain goes through the spinal cord. And like any highway, this can kind of get jammed. And, and it's not that 
I think this, this bone on a nerve model is somewhat outdated. Um, it maybe lends itself to an easy analogy, but it's not perfectly accurate. So in any event, though, these, these different misalignments can cause issues with the timing of signals that are sent in the nervous system. And I want you to think of the nervous system a bit like you may think of an intersection, okay? So an intersection doesn't have a terribly complicated spectrum of signal types. And similarly, for any given neuron, there's maybe a handful of different neurotransmitters that that neuron may release. Now, so it's not that there's a, um, like I said, a crazy spectrum of signal types, it's that the cadence or the timing of those signals is crucially important. So back to that intersection, if the lights in an intersection are mistimed, we can't really safely use an intersection anymore. So a lot of this involves a, a hopeful resolution of, of cadence problems within the nervous system that allow more normal function. So the upper cervical area is the most densely loaded in the entire body with something called a proprioceptor. Uh, have you heard that term? I've heard it, but I don't know much about it. Okay, perfect. So so proprioceptors are sensory neurons. They're everywhere in your body. They're um, sensitive to mechanical stimulation. So they're on your skin. They're sensitive to how gravity is pushing on you and affecting you. They are why our brain is typically and hopefully keenly aware of where we are in space. This is why if you closed your eyes, you could probably find your nose. And even if someone moved your hand, you could still find your nose, right? Um, and that's because you are sensing how gravity is affecting you constantly. So when we have a misalignment in that upper cervical region, the thinking is that that alters and interferes with some of this proprioceptive input. So like I mentioned, that is the most densely loaded with those types of neurons. And those neurons are constantly sending signals up to the brain, to the vestibular system, uh, and to the kind of integrating centers between those two to help your brain know where you are in space. Now you can imagine though, if there's a misalignment in that area, well, some of these joints are then getting sort of crunched down on more than others. Some are maybe getting stretched. Uh, there's a rotation component. Basically that, that disc, I, that ring-shaped vertebrae, the atlas uh, that I described earlier, that can misalign sort of three-dimensionally. So, and again, it's sort of sliding around somewhat spherical surfaces, or it'll, it'll serve this analogy to think of it that way. So it's not so much that we can trace out exactly what's going wrong, but just that there's aberrant input going into the nervous system, to the brain, and the brain is doing its best to integrate these sometimes confusing and nonsensical signals, but it becomes a bit of a garbage out, gar or excuse me, garbage in, garbage out type situation. Uh, does that all make some sense? Is that clear? Yeah, definitely. Okay, so those types of issues are why we see, um, I think, a lot of vertigo problems, dizziness. Um, I'll get back to the post-concussion one in just a second, but these migraines, these headaches, essentially, if the brain is getting signals that, doesn't make, that don't make sense, it's not going to operate at its best. And how that manifests itself you know, can be a number of different ways. But suffice it to say that we want your brain getting the healthiest and, and most accurate signals from your body, and you want it to send out the most healthy and accurate signals to the body. Now, on the topic of post-concussion syndrome, there's some really cool stuff coming out. A gentleman named Dr. Scott Rosa is doing some studies with phonar MRI. This is a type of video MRI where they're looking at the fluid movement of the cerebrospinal fluid. So CSF, uh, one of the main functions of this is to sort of wash away, among other things, one of the main functions is to wash away cellular waste, uh, metabolic waste that builds up in the brain throughout the day. Okay, so every cell in your body all day long creates toxic waste and we're pretty brilliantly designed to metabolize, excrete, get rid of these things and they really cause no issue for us when we do that. Uh, now the issue here though, when that atlas is misaligned, what can happen is it will sort of occlude that opening at the base of the skull. It's called the foramen magnum. And it'll slow or change, I should say, it'll alter the flow rate of that cerebrospinal fluid. So there's sort of two things that happen with that. One, there's a backup of these metabolic byproducts or a potential backup of these metabolic byproducts that uh, could be toxic from a cellular perspective. Um, and two, there's a pressure buildup. So, you know, one of the, the main issues with concussions is the swelling, these, these pressure changes in the head. So you can imagine if the pressure valve at the base of the skull is twisted too tight, uh, that person's going to have a very slow and laborious recovery. If they can get that adjusted, 
uh, and altered and restore some normalcy to that flow rate, well, then that person might have a, a much swifter and more complete recovery. Now, that depending on how acute the concussion is, they might still want to be under care with a vestibular specialist or a functional neurologist or some of these other um, groups who have specialized in these other things that um, complement um, and really are an important total package for resolving those issues. You know, I want to be clear, it's certainly not that I'm suggesting that people have like motor oil building up in their brain, but we are really, really sensitive chemically to any changes in our body. And so the slightest alteration in the solution of just about any, any fluid in any tissue can change enzymatic functions. It can change how proteins behave. It can change all sorts of different things. It can change how sensitive certain um, neurons are to firing. And so you can see how this can be a bit of a quagmire to trace out, okay, well, here's exactly what's going wrong. And it's a little bit more of a, well, here's sort of all the things going wrong. And it's hard to put your finger on exactly what is the most important or what's the most contributing. And then between you know, two people, it's always a little different. So hopefully that paints a picture and, and people can realize that the goal is to restore normalcy to function, not necessarily intervene and, and improve on the natural process, just allow the natural process to function normally and optimally. Got it. Do you feel like we're seeing an increase in these problems? Like, are we doing more things to inhibit this natural process? Or why do you think all of these things seem to be on the rise? Yeah, no, that's a brilliant question. Um, and, and if we get to talking about evolutionary biology here in just a second, I'll, um, I will kind of expand on some of that more. But, you know, the reality is, and, and I am certainly a bit of a naturalist. I, my bias is absolutely that nature has done a pretty remarkable job um, getting us to where we are. And uh, I certainly think the human body is a lot more capable of healing um, than not. And I think tragically, we've sort of been disempowered on our health in this country. And, and I, again, that circles back to why I think patient education is so important. So, uh, you know, so the 21st century is at war with your spine. You know, we sit more than ever before. Some estimates put that at 12 hours a day for the average American. We stare down at our phones and computer screens that are way too low, way too much. And we're less active or physically challenged than we've been in the last several hundred thousand years. So, I mean, you think about it, we used to have to hunt for all of our food and now we can get it all through the window of our car from a clown, right? So we've sort of disconnected with what would be the natural stresses on the human body. And I think in the absence of those normal healthy stresses, or I should say kind of historically natural healthy stresses, um, and then with the implementation of these things that are pretty terrible for your spine, just sitting all day long, looking down in these awkward positions and postures, uh, it makes some sense why there might be kind of a surging of these issues we're seeing, at, at least at least those uh, associated with the misalignment component, you know. And of course, all the things I mentioned are complicated in their own right. They all have multiple contributing factors. So this is not an island, you know. What we do often see complete resolution of many of those things. Um, I wouldn't say or expect that to be the only thing going on, and, and it's important that we vet out what else might be going wrong for a patient, get them co-managed with the, uh, the appropriate professional. So. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So you said evolutionary biology, let's talk about that. Cause you and I talked about this a little bit in person and I think you have a really like fascinating perspective on this as well. So walk us through your research and your theories on this. Yeah, absolutely. So, so evolutionary biology is a pretty cool topic and we're going to rewind a few billion years to get started here. Um, so some of the first animals, and it's even funny to think of them as animals because they seem to us more like plants, but uh, sponges, right? So these, these things you might see on a coral reef, the simplest ones were just sort of tube-shaped columns, and uh, their nervous system, they were obviously sort of planted there, they couldn't really move, maybe sort of undulate a little bit in place in some instances, but for the most part, these were not predatory hunters, and at that time, there wasn't too much to hunt anyway. So they sort of sit there and, and let debris and food stuff floating through the water catch into them. And then it's sort of metabolized from that point. But with that immobility, uh, their nervous system is what's called a nerve net. Okay. So this is the simplest, well, one of the simplest forms of a, a nervous system to my knowledge. There's no sort of special congregation of nerves throughout. They're sort of evenly distributed and they sort of um, kind of like a web throughout this, this creature's body. And so they, they 
aren't terribly capable of complex, complex neurological function. So as we mosey along through evolution, um, you know, one of the next things that came along are these, this phylum Nideria, and they're kind of jellyfish looking creatures, right? And so these have what's called a nerve ring or a nerve disc. And so they have a slightly more centralized concentration of nerves in the middle, um, but it's still not terribly complicated. And I think that's pretty fitting because if you look at a jellyfish, Again, you've never been like, oh, there's a creature of grace and elegance. And, you know, it, it's sort of just floating aimlessly through the water and can undulate itself and maybe push a foot or two in one direction. But for the most part, is really at the mercy of the current, right? And so as we continue on, we then get what's called cephalization. So this is where, you know, I think uh, flatworms or something of that nature might have been one of the next steps there. So these, these little, still very simple creatures, but they actually have a head now. And with that head comes a concentration of nerves or, or neurons and, and uh, eventually a brain that helps them uh, utilize their special sense organs that, are, that have then developed, um, as well as achieve increasingly complex types of movement. Okay. So again, if we look at, you know, a flatworm, it's, it's still not something that's physically impressive in how it moves, but it certainly can direct itself better than, than the sponge or the jellyfish. And as we move along, we, we, you know, we get into, I believe, chondrochythes, where like the fish, or excuse me, sharks, ostrochythes are like fish. And so you, you move up and as the nervous system is getting more and more complex, so too are our, or were the animal's abilities to move, to engage in different physical mediums, um, to explore different landscapes, you know, and then things came out of water and there's an explosive explosion of life on, on land. And then some things, some mammals went back into water. You know, I think it's really amazing that flight evolved four times. You know, there's bats, uh, mammals of, of all flight, birds, obviously, insects and pterodactyls. Don't sleep on pterodactyls. It's easy one to forget. And I don't actually know where they fit into all of this, but um, but it, it's incredible to see that I think one of the main driving forces in evolution was the ability to to navigate different mediums more effectively. Uh, and then you get to humans and, you know, we have some of the most complicated nervous systems and our movement is also some of the most complicated really in the animal kingdom. So our bipedalism and our ability to walk around on two legs was not really achievable without a lot of brain power going toward balance uh, related things, right? I mean, you can look at the the research or the robots being <clears throat> made at the Boston's Robotics Lab, and it's incredible to see, you know, some of the brightest minds in the world um, for a long time struggling with how do we get these things to to maintain balance. And it's it's remarkable if I don't know if you're familiar, if you've seen any of like the videos on YouTube, you know, just a few years ago, they have these things with four to six legs walking around very clumsily slipping on banana peels. Um, and I most recently just saw some robot doing parkour. So I'm afraid that the reign of humankind might only have a decade left before some sort of Skynet takeover. But uh, in any event, it's really impressive to see that that's where a lot of the, the brain power in robotics is going into balance related things for these. Uh, and, and that's certainly where a lot of the um, evolutionary push was toward, uh, like I said, increasingly complex forms of movement demanding an increasingly complex brain. Now, alongside that, there's certainly other things that drove that. Changes in our diet likely played a role. Changes in our social structure played a role. Um, so nothing, nothing that I've described is an isolated incident. And I certainly uh, want to be careful not to anthropomorphize evolution. It's not necessarily a, a thinking process. It's something that we can kind of reflect on, look back on and see what happened and what guided um, what types of changes. So Hopefully that kind of makes some sense and is interesting, but you can see how our balance centers and those proprioceptors I described earlier are crucially important because those, among other sensory organs, help keep us upright. You know, it's kind of, a, I think it's a miracle that anyone can step off a curb, you know, look to their left, see some truck barreling down the road, do the math instantly, you know how far is away is that? How fast is it closing, closing on me? Is it accelerating? Can I safely get across the street? 
you know, they look to the, to the other side, see another car, do the same calculation, all the while remembering and estimating, hey, the first car that I'm not, no longer looking at, how close is that likely to have gotten? You know, we walk across the street, the wind's blowing, we don't fall over, we step down, we're probably on our phone the whole time we're doing this. It's incredible to think of how much brain power is navigating uh, or, or, or being dedicated to these things that we really take for granted but they're really miraculous when you understand what all is coming together to make that a reality. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. This episode is powered by Ritual. They make vitamins specifically designed just for women. Ritual vitamins contain nine essential nutrients that most women just don't get enough of, including vitamin B12 as methylcobalamin form, folate and not the synthetic folic acid, D3, K2, vitamin E, omega-3 fatty acids, boron, chelated iron, and a proprietary form of magnesium. Ritual supplies all of these in forms that are easily absorbed and utilized, and their capsules are vegan, gluten-free, allergen-free, and non-GMO. They have both a prenatal and a regular women's multivitamin, both designed specifically for women and synergistic for women's hormones. Did you know, for instance, that 40% of women cannot properly use folic acid due to an MTHFR gene variation? Ritual contains a natural form of folate and synergistic nutrients, so the entire multi is more effective. This is especially important pre-pregnancy or during pregnancy, because during pregnancy especially, folate is vital. According to OBGYN Jason Rothbart, most women don't find out they're pregnant until about four to seven weeks pregnant which is past the first 28 days. In the first 28 days, the baby's organs are rapidly forming and the neural tube, which becomes the central nervous system and the vertebral column, is almost completely formed and closed by the end of 28 days. In other words, you need those nutrients in your body before you get pregnant. The essential nutrient folate helps promote healthy development of the neural tube, and this is why many doctors recommend taking a quality prenatal for several months before trying to get pregnant. Ritual makes this easy with both a prenatal and a regular women's multivitamin. And you can learn more about both by going to wellnessmama.com forward slash go forward slash ritual. So again, wellnessmama.com forward slash go forward slash R-I-T-U-A-L. This podcast is sponsored by Thrive Market, a company that I have known and loved since its very beginning. The goal of Thrive Market is to make real food affordable for everyone, and now they help their half a million members, including me, get organic foods that we love delivered to our door for less. Think of it as an online combination of Costco and Whole Foods with tons of organic, allergy-friendly, paleo, vegan, keto, and other options. Their annual membership earns you free gifts and guaranteed savings, and this is one of my favorite parts. An annual membership that you pay for also sponsors a free membership for a family in need. So you'll get 25 to 50% off top brands. And as a tip, I always look at the new Thrive Market brand products that provide an even bigger discount on their 500 plus high quality products. You can check out all of their products and save an additional 25% on your first order by going to thrivemarket.com forward slash WM. So that's thrivemarket.com forward slash WM for Wellness Mama. And if you're already a member, still go to thrivemarket.com forward slash WM and check out because Thrive often runs deals of the day and gifts with purchase. So even if you're already a member, you can often get free products when you shop on certain days. So always keep an eye out for those and always check out the new deals at thrivemarket.com forward slash WM. Another thing I want to make sure we talk about and jump around a little bit is chronic pain because um, I hear from a lot of people who are struggling with that. I've never experienced it myself. I've experienced like chronic, the fatigue side with Hashimoto's, um, although that's much better now, but I can only imagine what someone who has chronic pain is going through and it would, I guess, be, I would think it would be a very difficult thing. And I know that that's something that you have researched and also worked with people on. So can we talk about chronic pain? Yeah, I would love to. This is a um, really, really interesting topic. So 
you know, so chronic pain, and this is great because I know your listeners are familiar with the topic of neuroplasticity. I know it comes up all the time um, with people you have on the show. So neuroplasticity, just to be brief, are these sort of um, plastic changes to the function of the nervous system. What that means is basically your experiences throughout life um, and the input that your brain receives will guide and shape how your brain integrates and behaves with future input, okay? So neuroplasticity by itself is not is neither good nor bad. It just is. It means our brains adapt, okay? And so they can certainly adapt for the better or for the worse. And so when we have something like chronic pain, we have to remember that let's just say someone has, let's stick with, uh, with knee pain, okay? So we don't feel pain in our knee. We sense pain in our knee. We feel pain in our brain, okay? And so if the tissue in question even if it's healed, if we trigger something that, that lights up that pathway in our brain, well, we can feel pain whether or not we truly authentically sensed pain, okay? And so you, you've probably heard of like phantom limb syndrome. That's probably the easiest example to give, right? Where somebody might have lost a limb um, and they then wake up in the night with that foot hurting or, or, or itching, right? And the foot's gone. So we know that the sensory organ right there in the foot is certainly not what's generating that sensation. It's something in the brain that's generating that. So when we have chronic pain, you can imagine if somebody has woken up every day for 10 years with pain, well, those experiences are basically kind of solidifying that pain pathway and in its hypersensitivity, okay? So it's tricky because sometimes when you explain this to people, there's this knee-jerk reaction that it's like, oh, so you're telling me this is in my head. Well, no, I'm telling you, electrically speaking, it is within your cranium, yes, but it's not that you're crazy, right? And so we have to understand that we've essentially trained the brain, you know, like Pavlov's dogs, we have trained the brain to experience pain, whether or not we're still authentically generating those pain signals from the sensory organs in question. So it's, it's a kind of the million dollar question is, well, how do we unwire that, right? Or rewire it. Um, and, and certainly this is where patient education plays a tremendously powerful role. People have to understand, hey, no, you have healthy tissue. You're, you're healthy. We just have to get your body to remember that and to believe that. Um, and so it, it's, it's one of those things where Sometimes you'll have someone say, oh, well, you know, okay, every time I wake up saying I'm not going to feel pain anymore, well, I feel pain that day. And, and the issue is that we didn't say you have to say you're not feeling pain anymore. You have to subconsciously know and believe, and the operant world that we're there is subconsciously, uh, know and believe that you are, in fact, free of pain or that the tissue is healthy. So a lot of the therapeutic targets of this involve kind of taking people just shy of maybe ranges of motion that elicit pain or um, just gently pushing that boundary and getting people more comfortable and confident and familiar with certain positions and realizing, oh, this doesn't cause pain. And then you kind of push the envelope a little bit more, a little bit more, and hopefully can rewire those things. But in the absence of at least education first on how that works, I think there's going to be a very low ceiling on how much better a lot of chronic pain patients can get. You know, and I'll give you just a couple examples. So a friend of mine is uh, an all-American shot putter and a very, very big guy. Grew up on a farm, was probably the biggest beast on that farm. He's about 285 pounds and he's, he's, he's a lean guy. Now he had an injury in college where he herniated a disc and I think it was pretty poorly mismanaged by the, the medical staff he had access to. And so now, you know, over 10 years later, he'll sometimes when working out, he'll think he, he still feels that disc. And it's funny because you can take him, you know, again, weighs 285 pounds, you can load 95 pounds on his back and he'll squat a little bit and he'll sometimes, you know, stand up and be like, I think I feel it, you know, starting to, starting to bother me. And what's happening here is that his brain very much expects that pain because that's what it associates, that squatting motion is what he associates with the original injury. So you can take the same guy and you can stress his back in a mechanically identical way that doesn't remind him of the pain and he will often not notice it at all. So 
Is he crazy? No, absolutely not. He's just been conditioned very, very effectively for a very, very long time. And now those neural circuits are firing without his permission, right? And without his want. Uh, but that's sort of the, that, that's the gist of chronic pain is these neuroplastic changes, unfavorable neuroplastic changes that are made that unfortunately don't seem to resolve by themselves because they really don't have too much reason to, you know? And so I'll talk about a cool study, not a chronic pain study, but something that shows the expectation bias at its best. Uh, there's recently a study conducted where they looked at, um, I think, 116 different people who, who performed a, uh, a cardiovascular test, like an aerobic endurance test. Um, and they had done some genetic testing on everyone before this. They, they conducted the aerobic test. They measured both objective and subjective criteria for performance. And then these groups uh, or these people were divided into roughly three groups. And there, were, there was a group that had a, ro uh, a gene that was um, somewhat favorable for aerobic performance. Um, a group that's pretty neutral and a group that has a gene that's unfavorable for aerobic performance. Okay, so they split the groups up into those thirds. And then regardless of what they found genetically, they told half the group, hey, you've got the gene to be really good at this, uh, you know, the favorable gene. And they told the other half, you've got the, the unfavorable gene. They retested everyone, I think a week later, and almost... 100% across the board, and I think almost all objective and subjective criteria either improved or decreased based on what the patient or the participant was told they had genetically. And again, half those people were lied to or more. So it's a really powerful finding because it shows that this expectation bias literally changed their objective and subjective performance. They ran, meaning how fast did they run? How much oxygen did they, did they consume? How far did they run? How hot did they feel? You know, how laborious does this feel? All of those different things were recorded. And based on what they expected to be true, they performed in, accordingly. Um, so, so it's, a, a, again, a really, really powerful study. And the, the sort of knee-jerk reaction people have when I tell them about this is <laughs> – you know, mind over matter, you know, if you believe it, you can achieve it, you can, you can set your mind to anything. And whether or not that's true, that's not exactly what the study showed. What the sh study showed is if a scientist in a white lab coat is standing in front of you saying, hey, I just did your blood work and you've got bad genes, well, you're going to believe that and that will affect how you perform. So this is why I think it's crucially important that clinicians be very, very careful with the narrative they share with patients because that patient is going to own what you tell them, you know, and that patient is going to really, really internalize that. And if you're not careful, uh, they're going to catastrophize and they're going to have this, this kiss of death, death diagnosis that really shouldn't be as stressful for them as it has become. And again, that's, that's often a function of just not understanding it well enough, uh, or the patient not understanding it well enough. That's so fascinating. And I've definitely heard the inverse of that as well. People who were told they had some terminal illness and then when they died and did the autopsy, they actually didn't. It was a misdiagnosis, but they believed they were going to die. So they did. And I think that's obviously a very extreme case, but this is an area that I feel like I'm only starting to delve into the research on. It's so fascinating. Um, for years, I was the type of like, oh, you just, it's, you know, I want to see the data and the science and just power through and like the emotions and what you believe don't really have a place. And I've come to realize so much in the last couple of years, just how much they really, really do. But I think also your perspective on that was so good. It's not that just whatever you set your mind to, you're going to achieve. What the study actually looked at was when someone in authority tells you this and you believe them. So that's a really important key as well, because I see, I see studies like that used for just like this kind of more esoteric, like, oh, if you believe it, it will happen. But you're right. It, that's not exactly what the study said. Exactly. And, and you have to understand, like, are you telling yourself you believe that or do you authentically subconsciously believe that? Do you expect that to be true, you know, from, from a subconscious level? And if not, well, then I think that that's just wishful thinking to say, oh, it's all going to resolve. I, I think so. Or, you know, and I don't mean to, um, power of positivity is a very, very real thing. So I certainly don't mean to undermine that. My point is just that if you wake up and say, I'm not going to have pain. Well, sorry, the last 10 years of your experience is telling the rest of your brain that you are. So that's probably not going to fool your brain. Yeah. But then it's a great springboard to go back to what you talked about earlier of, but it is still possible to retrain the brain. It just, you have to 
have a little bit more of a long-term approach basically, right? It seems that way now. Yeah. And that that's something that's being heavily investigated and debated and discussed. And um, I certainly don't have all the solutions, but I think that in the absence of education, like I said, there's going to be a very low ceiling on how much better someone can get. So I think we need to start there. Um, now, there have been studies looking at this biopsychosocial model to pain and, and um, is patient education alone enough? Um, and from what I've read, no, it does not work in isolation. Uh, some sort of manual therapy does seem to massively aid alongside patient education uh, and exercise in the improvement or reduction of those chronic pain symptoms. Um, you know, and one, one other example on chronic pain that it's just sort of become, become a popular teaching point in the office, um, my old employee's um, grandmother-in-law was a lady that uh, suffered from debilitating back pain for decades until she got dementia and she forgot she had back pain and she never experienced or complained of her back pain again. So that's one kind of anecdotal thing. I don't know if, how many studies have looked at back pain and dementia, but I think it drives home this point that, you know, when we subconsciously expect there to be pain and in many cases identify with that pain or that condition, uh, it will stay alive and well until we start to reframe that. And, and that's, that's where I think, uh, again, a lot of clinicians will serve their patients best spending a little more time there. That's so fascinating, it, but it makes sense. And it's, yeah, because it, that would bypass those mechanisms in the brain. So interesting. Yeah, I hope they study that more. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and pain science is definitely a hot topic right now. There's a lot of really brilliant people looking at it. So it does, a lot of it does seem to reaffirm some of what's been discovered in the last couple of decades, but uh, the, the treatments um, and that medium through which we can influence that is still being discussed. Wow. Well, so yeah, just something to continue exploring. That's really, really interesting. And I cannot believe I just looked at the clock. Our time is flying by and there's a couple of questions I'd love to ask at the end. So I might have to do a round two one day because this went by so quickly. I would love that. I think there's probably many more topics that we can springboard into based on questions from this episode. That would be awesome. Yeah. And I, I hope my um, rambling was coherent here. I've got, uh, like I told you, I've got so many notes for different things I wanted to talk about. We've sort of bounced around a little bit. So I really hope it's uh, it's been clear enough for people to get the gist of it. But. Yeah, I think so. And as we start to wrap up, um, the two questions I love to ask at the end are, first, if there is like a single piece of advice that you could give and spread far and wide, what it would be and why? That is a fantastic question. Um, you know what I think it would be is to surround yourself with people smarter than you and argue with them. Okay. That's the best way to learn. I've been very, very blessed with a lot of brilliant mentors, both family mentors and academic uh, mentors that have helped shape my understanding of these things. And I think until you're surrounding yourself with people who are authorities on certain topics, um, you're going to be limited in, in how much or the depth that you can learn something at. And, uh, and of course, you know, when I say argue with them in this instance, I don't mean like getting a Facebook fight with them. I mean like formal debate, you know, and, and, and with a, a healthy respect for maybe what you don't know um, and, and a very much a willingness to change your position. Uh, I think that's a crucially important thing for all people, clinicians, scientists, and patients alike. And, and that's a, uh, yeah, that's where I would guide you to, to learn more. That might be my favorite, like one advice question answer that I've ever gotten, because especially when you said argue with them, because you always hear like, always be the dumbest person in the room, or you are the sum of the five people you surround yourself with. But the argue with them, that's so brilliant, because then you're actually learning and hopefully challenging your own views as well, which I think is such a key. That's awesome. I love that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And it, it's good to, to find people that disagree with you. You know, some of my best friends in healthcare, we disagree on a lot of different things and we have great debates and we both come away from those discussions with a little bit more polished perspective of, of our position and, and the counterpoints. That's awesome. And lastly, is, is there a book or number of books that have really influenced your life? And if so, what are they? That's a, yeah, another great question. I love books. Um, I think uh, one of my favorite books is On the Shortness of Life by Seneca, um, kind of an ancient wisdom, stoic philosophy book. It's an uh, amazing read. It's a dense read. You can tell, you know, as, as uh, conversation has become 
or has, uh, uh, yeah, as conversation and, and voicing your opinions has become more and more convenient, I think people have become a lot less intentional with their words and that's tragic. Um, but that, that was certainly written in a time where you had to be very, very purposeful with everything you, you put on paper. I don't know if they use paper then, but however they recorded it. Um, and then another one, and actually one of my favorite books I've ever read, it's on evolutionary biology. It's called Darwin's Blind Spot. It is a book that that takes Darwin's hypothesis that that evolution is a survival of the fittest, and not that he actually necessarily said exactly and only that. Uh, but this book makes a case that we have almost more examples of survival of the most cooperative. So we have crazy, like just the coolest examples of things down from fungi and bacterial relationships benefiting each other to this kind of global um, biosphere perspective of, of the whole earth as an organ system. So some of it's a little bit more philosophical and some of it's more scientific, but it's really amazing to see how animals and plants co-evolved with each other um, and how they've occupied these, these niches together. And I think it just, it, it's like a very humbling book to read, but it inspires you with like the brilliance of nature. So I love those two books. Those are two I'd recommend to anyone. Thank you. And lastly, where can people find you if they want to learn more or especially if they're in your area, if they want to come visit you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so I own Denver Upper Cervical Chiropractic. We have a lot of patients that travel in from other states for care. So people can always come in for care if they um, would like to. I, I try to stay off social media. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have much of a presence there, but uh, we might be starting a podcast, my brother and I, pretty soon. He's getting his um, PhD in neurophysiology right now, uh, where we interview scientists. So stand by for details on that. That might be a fun place to learn some cool novel studies and, and what's going on in different fields. Awesome. And Ty, thanks so much for your time today and for sharing your wisdom. This has been so fascinating. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Katie. I appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for listening and sharing your valuable asset of your time with us today. And I hope that you'll join me again on the next episode of the Wellness Mama podcast. If you're enjoying these interviews, would you please take two minutes to leave a rating or review on iTunes for me? Doing this helps more people to find the podcast, which means even more moms and families can benefit from the information. I really appreciate your time. And thanks as always for listening.